Hi, Bayless Conley here. And uh, today we're going to be talking about overcoming sexual temptation. I know no one is interested in a subject like sex and sexual temptation. Of course, it's not applicable to anyone. But you might just want to watch uh, so that you can share it with the person that knows a person that knows a person that knows a person or just might be applicable to you. Biblical Guide for Overcoming Sexual Temptation. Let's get into the Word. All right, Proverbs 5 and verse 14 it says, I was on the verge of total ruin in the midst of the assembly and congregation. It's an amazing statement. In church and on the verge of total ruin, and there may be here today you're in such a state. You're on the verge of a ruined marriage, or on the verge of a ruined reputation, or ruined finances, or ruined relationship with your kids, or emotional ruin, or spiritual ruin. And you need to listen carefully to what I have to say. You may be tottering on the precipice of, of you know, engaging in uh, an affair with, with someone. Maybe you've already messed up in your life, and you're eating some of the bitter fruit, some of the, you're experiencing some of the consequences for what you've done. Well, if that's the case, I just want to tell you to take heart, because God is a God of mercy, and He's a God of forgiveness, and even though the things we do can't be undone, and some of the consequences, you know, that they, they will be experienced, God still has a future, and He still has a hope for you. He still has good things planned for your future. So I, I, I plead with you, listen carefully to what I have to share with you today. I want to begin by giving you several warning signs of impending danger in this arena of life. All right, number one warning sign, amorous glances, flirtatious looks. Look at Proverbs 6 and 25 with me if you would. It says, do not lust after her beauty in your heart nor let her allure you with her eyelids. Today's English version says, don't be trapped by their flirting eyes. You know, the story of Joseph in Potiphar's house, as we read it in Genesis 39, it says that Potiphar's wife began making eyes at Joseph. She tried to persuade him to commit adultery with her, but it all began with the looks that she gave him. Now, I, I have eye contact with people all the time, and it's, you know, perfectly in order, especially in our culture. But if when you catch someone's eyes, there seems to be some sort of an amorous connection, it's time to focus somewhere else. Especially if you're married. The last thing you need to do is be flirting with someone other than your spouse. You know, he said, don't lust after her beauty in your heart, and then don't be captured by the flirtatious looks. It's interesting that the flirtatious looks and the heart are put together. Jesus said it's out of the heart that fornications and, and immoral acts proceed. And the fact is, your eyes are one of the gateways to your heart. If your wife says, listen, I don't like the way she was looking at you, listen to your wife. <laughs> if your husband says, look, I don't like the way that guy was looking at you. Listen to your husband. And I'm not talking about enforcing some sort of, you know, uh, jealous paranoia. I'm just talking about being wise and realizing that your eyes can be a gateway into your emotions. You know, some woman looks you up and down and then winks at you, or some guy checks you out and smiles at you that can really feed your ego but it can also end up being the first chink in your armor if you're not careful. All right, second warning sign is the warning sign of flattery. Proverbs 6, verse 23. For the commandment is a lamp, the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life to keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress. Look at chapter 5 and verse 3. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. And of course, we know it goes both ways. The lips of an immoral man drip honey. His mouth can be smoother than oil. 
drips honey. It's, it's sweet to the ear. It's sweet to hear. Smooth as oil. It seems so natural and so unrehearsed. Surely it must be sincere. You know, it's interesting, the word drip in this verse where it says, you know, the words of a, an immoral person drip honey, that word drip is also translated in your Bible as prophesy. Find it in Micah, Micah chapter 2 several times. It's also used throughout Scripture to indicate inspired speech. And the idea of that is that, you know, he or she almost seems to be telling you your innermost thoughts, the things that you most wanted to hear, it almost seems inspired. You're thinking, man, I wish my wife would just tell me. Sometimes she appreciates me. I feel so unappreciated. And this really pretty girl at work just sort of offhandedly says, you know, I hope your wife appreciates what she's got. Because a guy like you doesn't come along too often. <laughs> You're going, whoa. He ended up thinking about it all day. And suddenly your attention is focused on that girl or, you know, the wife's thinking, man, I just wish my husband would tell me occasionally that I look nice or that, that I have some good ideas. And some handsome guy at work or somewhere else says, you know what, I, I need to apologize to you. Like, what for? Well, you know, when you first started working here, I thought, surely this girl doesn't have a brain in her head. She is so beautiful. But you've proved me wrong. You, 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 you're brilliant as well as beautiful. You're thinking, wow. That, I was just thinking that. Yeah, this guy understands me more than my husband does. I just feel this connection. And you know, I tell you, it can be inspired because we do have an enemy that walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and he wants to devour your marriage. He wants to devour your peace. He wants to devour your relationship with God. And so it says that the words drip like honey and they're smoother than oil. Listen, a sincere compliment is okay. But like one guy said, when somebody pats you on the back, they're usually wanting you to cough something up. In other words, they're working you. They're flattering you in hopes of getting something from you, like sex. All right, third warning sign, inappropriate touch. Proverbs 6 and 27. Can man take fire in his bosom, to his bosom and not, and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. And we understand when he says whoever touches her, it's talking about the act of adultery. But it also includes all of the touches that led up to the act, even the seemingly innocent ones. The comforting hand on the shoulder. Picking a piece of lint off her sweater. You know, just the touch to his hand or to your hand. You know, some people, once that touch has happened, they think about it all day long. Their mind continually, continually comes back to it. We need to be careful because touch is a powerful communicator. We need to be aware of that. You know, a hug's not always appropriate. It says in Ecclesiastes 3, there's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. And one of the times to refrain from embracing is if you're attracted to that person and you are not married to them. So that is a warning sign. All right, fourth warning sign is this. Avoid the scenes of temptation. Look in Proverbs 5 and verse 8, if you would. Talking about the, you know, seductress. It says, remove your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Everybody say far. Remove, you do something. You remove your way far. Don't pray that God will give you strength. You just get far away. <laughs> Don't come near the door of her house. The Amplified Bible puts it this way. Avoid the very scenes of temptation. To pray, God, give me strength and don't lead me into temptation when you're thrusting yourself into temptation is lunacy. Well, I'm strong enough. No, you're a fool. 
Can you take fire to your bosom and your clothes not get burned? Answer, no. I remember I was with some friends once. I was living down in, in Mexico, and we were sitting around the kitchen and talking, and there weren't any chairs left, so I hopped up on the stove, and I'm sitting there, and the tail of my shirt got too close to the pilot light, and my shirt burst into flames while I was wearing it. Yeah, it wasn't fun at all, and I had no shirt left, and I was a bit singed when I finally got through ripping it off. Everybody else thought it was funny. It was not funny. The fact is, is you get too close to the fire and you will end up getting burned. You are not immune. Consider these verses, if you would. 1 Corinthians 6 and 18, it says, flee sexual immorality. 2 Timothy 2 and 22, it says, flee youthful lust. And how many know you don't have to be young to have youthful lusts? All the old people said, amen. Flee youthful lust. Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife and from the temptation. Proverbs 5 and, eight, 5 and 8, remove your way far from her or him. Don't go near the door of their house. Run away, the Bible says. Oh, but that just doesn't seem very courageous. Run away. Ecclesiastes said a living dog is better than a dead lion. Let you muse on that one for a little while. Avoid the scenes of temptation. Don't make provision for your flesh to fulfill the lust thereof, it says in the book of Romans. And I was, uh, I just met Janet. We'd had our first date and there just, you know, I just had this sense that God might be in the relationship. And it was the next night, I, I was working at a wait, as a waiter in a restaurant and uh, this couple sat down at a table that I was waiting on and, and a, 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 another lady sat down, very attractive lady, sat down with them. And I went up to the table and I'm always trying to be nice and engage the people because you want to get a good tip. And uh, the uh, uh, lady that was there by herself, you know, was, was talking to me and uh, the other guys, they, they were giggling quite a bit about the fact that she was talking to me at the table. And, uh, you know, I, I brought them their food and she said, listen, and she starts talking to me. She says, you know, I, I, I own a beauty shop and I, I'd really like you to give me a call. And she told me somehow in the conversation before, you know, she's married but separated from her husband. And she slides her card across the table. So I take it, put it in my pocket. I said, thank you. And I went back in the kitchen, sat on a freezer and broke out into a sweat. <laughs> I didn't go back out and wait on the table anymore. I had one of the other guys go finish up. And I'm sitting on the, the, the freezer back in the kitchen, just literally sweating. And I went home and I took the card with me. And I threw it in a drawer in the little apartment I was in, closed the drawer, and was so agitated that night. You know, it's later in the evening, and I'm, I'm walking back and forth, and I'm, God, what's wrong? And he says, you know what's wrong. Why'd you save that card? I said, well, it's actually just sort of saving it in case I had a weak moment. <laughs> you know, when she gave me her card, I knew she didn't want to cut my hair. And so... I, I tore the card up in about a hundred little pieces and put it in three different trash cans. <laughs> because if you make provision for the flesh, friend, you're going to end up doing that thing. It's like the little boy comes home, he's soaking wet, and his dad says, you went swimming in the canal, and I told you not to. He says, well, Dad, I, I, I didn't plan on it. He says, what do you mean you didn't plan on it? You have your bathing suit on. <laughs> well, Dad, I, I, I took it just in case I was going to be tempted. No, avoid the scenes of temptation. Remove your way far from his or her door, however that applies to you. Practical wisdom, which brings us to it's just four more thoughts, things that you should do as opposed to things you shouldn't do. Number one, do consider the consequences. Do consider the consequences. We read in... Verse 3 of chapter 5, about the lips of an immoral woman dripping as honey and her mouth is smoother than oil. I'm going to tell you, that's the most expensive honey and oil you will ever buy. Verse 4, but in the end, she's as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. It'll be bitter in your conscience and bitter in the fruit that it produces. And here's some of the fruit. Verse 9, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the cruel one. 
your honor can be lost. What you have spent years earning, a lifetime spent earning an honorable name can be lost through one immoral act. Verse 10, lest aliens be filled with your wealth and your labors go to the house of a foreigner, you lose your wealth. Verse 11, and you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed. Sexually transmitted diseases, some of which they still do not have cures for as we know. Chapter 6, verse 30. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he's starving. Yet when one is found, he must restore sevenfold. He may have to give up all the substance of his house. Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. So it affects our relationship with God. Peter wrote, he said, avoid fleshly lust, abstain from fleshly lust that war against the soul. You know, I know there's some people in here today, just like the man that we read about in verse 14 of chapter 5. I was in the midst of the congregation and the assembly on the verge of total ruin. And I know some, you know, God, God help you, but in the, in the midst of trying to worship God, there's this battle going on in your soul because of certain things that you've given yourselves over to. It's just one of the consequences. It does affect our spiritual lives. In verse 33, wounds and dishonor he'll get, and his reproach will not be wiped away. Dishonor, reproach. Now God, when we repent, he forgives us, and as far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. What a merciful God we serve. But you know what? Everybody else isn't so merciful. Some people will never forget. And forever they will reference you by that one thing you did. And that will be their reference point for you. One translation says, a reputation permanently ruined. And it is just one of the consequences that needs to be considered. Verse 34, for jealousy is a husband's fury. Therefore, he'll not spare in the day of vengeance. He will accept no recompense, nor will he be appeased, though you give many gifts. Even if you don't fear God, you need to consider the wrath of an angry husband. He's liable to beat you up or shoot you down. Amen. And I, I, you know, people get caught up in the passion of something and don't realize you're not just affecting your life, you're ruining some other guy's life. You're ruining some other woman's life by sleeping with her husband. You know, when, when David slept with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, the prophet came and said, you had no pity, David. You had no mercy at all. It just didn't affect you. Think about all the other parties. Think about their kids. Think about how that's going to affect them, the rippling effect that just goes on and on. We do need to consider the consequences. And then the second thing, do be God conscious. We need to be conscious of God. Chapter 5 and verse 20. Look there with me. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman? and be embraced in the arms of a seductress. For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all of his paths. Even if nobody else sees, even if nobody else knows, God knows, God sees. And if we're God conscious, it'll help us. We told our kids from the time they're young, listen, mom and dad know we can't be with you all the time, and you're gonna do stuff that our eyes will never see, but God's eyes are always open. God's always watching. As the words to a friend's song go, Sitting in a parked car on a country road, you think no one is watching you, but you are not alone. God is there. Whether in the county jail or in the belly of a whale, God is there. And God does see it all. So we do need to be God conscious. And then thirdly, if you're married, have a vibrant romance with your spouse. Chapter 5, verse 15. Drink water from your own cistern running water from your own will. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be only your own and not for a stranger's with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. Do things together. Something that 
brings you joy and brings her joy, whether that's riding bikes together or going out, you know, to garage sales and hunting antiques or going to movies or reading a book, something that, that you can rejoice in together. Do, there's, you need to find some common ground to do some things together. And then you need to have sex a lot. <laughs> Let her breath satisfy you at all times. All times is a lot. <laughs> sex is good. Look with me, keep your finger here. We'll come right back here. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7. <laughs> Verse 1. 1 Corinthians 7 and 1. It says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. Likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again uh, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Be intimate as often as you need to or as often as you want to so you don't end up being tempted. Stay satisfied sexually in your, your marriage relationship. And you might be thinking, that's great, Pastor. I'm single. What do you have for me? <laughs> All right, I'll tell you this. Whatever station you are in life, God has grace for you. God has grace for the single, and God has grace for the married person. Listen, if you're single, there's a whole lot of stuff you have to face being married, other issues in life that you won't have to face being single. And there's grace for all of the, the, the aspects of married life and all of the challenges of married life, and there is grace for all of the aspects of single life and all of the challenges of single life, including our sexuality. And it's not just this grace that you're going to have to struggle and be miserable every day of your life. It's a grace that like a, a tide lifts up a boat. It lifts you up above some of those things so that it's not this, you know, miserable, you know, struggle every day. I'm just telling you there is grace, grace, grace. And after that, there's more grace. God has got you covered. All right, then a fourth thing that it's important for us to do is to have people that we're accountable to and that can speak into our life. Look back with me, if you would, at Proverbs 5. Have people that you're accountable to and that can speak into your life. Verse 1, my son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding. And then he went on throughout this chapter, and in chapter 6 it talks about listening to a father's wisdom and a mother's wisdom to keep you from falling into sexual temptation. Now whether that's a natural father and mother or whether a spiritual you know, a father or a mother in the faith. It's important to have someone that we can unburden our hearts to as well as, you know, to God in the place of prayer. I have men that, that I wouldn't hesitate to speak to them. If I was in trouble, I'd talk to them. I know first they wouldn't judge me. They would help me. They would have my best interest at heart. And, and it's just good to have people that you can talk to. Church, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you realizing that you've given us strong sexual desire. You've wired us up this way for a reason, but you wouldn't do it so that this fire would rage uncontrolled and destroy our family and our children and our honor and our own soul. God, we solicit help from you. We ask you to give us wisdom and to give us strength. And Lord, we, we just purpose in our heart to obey this practical wisdom and to consider amorous glances and flirtatious talk and inappropriate touch, avoiding the scenes of temptation. We do want to be conscious of you throughout our days, Lord, and we do want to weigh the consequences God, we know we need your help. 
So we ask you to strengthen us. And Lord, I pray right now that even as hearts, maybe there are people here that have already messed up. I pray that like a flood, your mercy and forgiveness would flow and cleanse every heart that repents as they sit in this house. Lord, that your mercy would restore, that your Holy Spirit would minister to every heart. And to those that have repeatedly yielded and they find themselves bound, I speak to those invisible chains to be broken in the name of Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for bringing freedom to those in your house today. Lord, I pray for marriages that they be strengthened. May husbands and wife and wives indeed find things that they can rejoice in together. May they find satisfaction and, and not live like two single people living separate lives under the same roof. May there be joy and harmony and love and spark and laughter in every home. God, I just pray blessing. I speak blessing over the marriages in this church. I speak blessing over the single people in this church, God. For those that desire to be married, I thank you for you satisfying and keeping them until you bring that one into their life. For those, God, that have made the decision that they're fine being single, I ask you to bless them in that decision they've made, O oh God, and use them as they devote themselves completely to the things of God. Thank you for blessing your people today, causing your face to shine upon everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we do live in a fallen world. Everything doesn't work the way that God originally intended it to work. We have an adversary, the devil, who walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And then we have our flesh to contend with. You know, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, he said, you know, the things I want to do, I don't do them. And the things that, that I don't want to do, I end up doing them. And he talked about the nature of sin that was still in his flesh that would want to pull him in the wrong direction. And of course, then he got into chapter 8 and talked about the answer to that by, you know, yielding to the Spirit and, and feeding on spiritual things and, and strengthening the spiritual side of us in order to overcome those physical temptations. The fact is we've got the world, the flesh, and the devil to contend with. But I just want to submit to you that the Spirit of God that lives in you is greater. Greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. Your born-again spirit with, with the nature of God in it is stronger than the nature of the flesh. You know what? We can overcome. He always causes us to triumph in Christ. So you may be feeling self-condemned right now and a lot of things have gone wrong in your life. Friend, God is not done with you. The good work He begun in you, He will complete it until the day of Christ. So take heart, friend. Get into the Word and let it strengthen you in Jesus' name.